here build mobile apps or mobile websites. Yeah, I hear this mobile thing is kind of a big thing. Um, so what I want to talk about today is building faster mobile websites. And faster is kind of an ambiguous term, right? We could share a lot of tips. We could talk about a lot of techniques. So what I thought uh, we would do here is actually take, uh, kind of put some constraints on the problem. The first constraint is uh, maybe even as a thought experiment, what would it take to build a mobile website to render in one second, that renders in one second, right? That's first. Um, and, and second, we want, we want it to be actually visible within one second. So by setting that constraint, we can actually work backwards. Or can, instead of just enumerating all the techniques for how we can make our sites fast, we can actually start looking from the ground up, like what, how long does the network take? How long does a browser take? And what, what does that uh, give you? And what kind of leeway do you have? So we're going to look at uh, network performance. We're going to look at how the browser renders the page. And then we're going to try and piece it all back together. So let's get right in. First of all, uh, before we even get into the technical uh, part of it, or part of this presentation, I always like to talk about why we care about this in the first place, right? Like, why do we want to make stuff fast? Uh, it certainly feels nice when something is fast and when it's responsive, but we actually have very good data to show that it also translates into revenue and engagement with your applications and all the rest. So I'll, I'll share a couple of examples with you. This is an experiment that we did at Google actually a few years ago, and uh, the experiment was basically what happens if we actually make search slower? We intentionally made the search slower for, for a group of users, and we, picked, we put them into different buckets. We said, well, uh, we're going to slow you down by 50 milliseconds, uh, this group by 200 milliseconds, and we're going to observe the changes in your behavior. Right? And further, we will also delay it in kind of different ways. For some users, we will delay the rendering of the search results. For some of the users, we'll delay rendering of the header. And basically, we're just trying to figure out like, how, do, how do users change their behavior. And what we found was that the impact on the daily searches actually went down the, the moment we slowed down the pages. So once we added 200 to 400 milliseconds, which is not a lot of time when you think about it, the number of daily searches went down by anywhere from 0.5 to 0.3%. Now, that may not seem like such a big deal, but trust me, when you work at Google scale, when your search uh, volume goes down by 0.3%, there's a lot of alarm bells going off in the building. So, but that's not, not only Google, actually. Bing did the same study uh, in parallel, and what they found was uh, they actually were more aggressive. They actually delayed some of their pages by two seconds. And what they found was that when they did this, the revenue per user dropped by 4%, 4.3%, which is massive, right, if you think about it. Uh, that's if nothing else, uh, there's not many features they can add to your pages or to your applications that will increase your revenue by 4.3%. So this is, this is definitely significant. And further, this is not only for big sites. This is not for Google Search and Bing and others. This is true universally. So um, Torbit, a great uh, company that does uh, ROM analytics, real user measurement, uh, they collated this data across a couple of billion data points from their customers. And what they were interested in was as the page load time increases, how does the behavior of the users change? And you can see here that there's a pretty uh, good correlation, which is to say for every second that the page takes longer, there's an increase in the bounce rate of your visitors. So basically, we have hard proof that shows that performance matters for the bottom line. So it's not just a feel good thing, right? Like I would, I, I love optimizing things. Uh, that's, you know, I wake up getting excited um, about that. But uh, there's also a very good business case for this sort of thing. And actually, uh, let me just go back for one second. I'll, I'll mention one more thing about Google. Uh, what we discovered was we ran this experiment for, I think, three or four weeks. And then we turned it off, right? Because we don't want to slow down your experience unnecessarily. Uh, and, the, and an interesting thing happened. People that were in these slower buckets didn't immediately go back to their previous behavior. They basically learned the slow behavior of the site. And it took them uh, approximately uh, two or three months to go back to the old behavior, so to start searching more frequently and more often. So we learn these behaviors, and we basically train our users to expect uh, you know, slow experiences. So that in itself is an interesting insight. So with that, right, uh, hopefully that at least uh, motivates the use case for performance. How are we doing today? We ran uh, some studies at Google, um, and I'll show you some numbers for the specific kind of uh, geographic regions and uh, medians and means. But first, uh, there's some pretty good constants that are out there. There's been a number of studies that have basically repeated um, the same results, or got the same results, I should say, where 
regardless of what medium you're talking about, whether it's a desktop app or a web app or something else, uh, anything that's below 100 milliseconds in terms of reaction time, like you click a button and you expect something to happen, if it's within 100 milliseconds, it feels instant. Right now, I, I know that there's some like hardcore gamers in this crowd and you're, and you're like, dude, I can tell you the difference between 35 milliseconds and 45 milliseconds. All right, um, and that's true, but for web browsing, that's not, that's not really an issue. Below 100 milliseconds, it feels instant. Uh, somewhere between 100 to 300 milliseconds, that's kind of like a sticky button. It's, it's not quite slow, but it feels kind of weird, like something just happened. Uh, somewhere between uh, up to one second, uh, you're still engaged, you're fully engaged in the task that you're doing, uh, but it feels sluggish. And after one second, basically the user switches context. It, it's the difference between you click a button and you get immediate feedback to you click a button and you're, and you're waiting, and then you're like, oh yeah, I gotta send an email to Bob, and I should talk to uh, Susie, and what was I doing again? Um, and, th and that's it, right? So the one second barrier is a very important threshold. Uh, you should stay below that because that, that at very least keeps the user focused on your application and, and helping them get the job done. So that's why we picked one second specifically uh, for this task. Now, here's some aggregate numbers. Uh, we ran this study with Google Analytics, which is installed on a significant fraction of the web, and we collected performance data. And uh, this is data as of, I think, April of last year, so maybe a year old data. And what we found was that, first of all, mobile, not surprisingly, is slower for a variety of reasons, and we'll talk about some of, the, some of these uh, in a second. But notice that the median uh, time on mobile is about five seconds, right? So this is, this is a far cry from the one second goal that, that we want to have. Like five seconds is, is a long time. And you know, the, the mean is even worse. And you can actually look at the distribution at, at the bottom. And by the way, I'll, I'll share the slides later. So you can guys, I encourage you guys to follow the links at the bottom of these slides. I have a lot of references that you can uh, go through later. So it's not looking good, uh, to be honest, right? Five seconds, uh, we are getting better though. And I put the star here for mobile and I, when talking about 4.8 seconds because this is actually optimistic. And the reason I say this, this is optimistic is because we gathered data using navigation timing, which is a new W3C standard, which means that it's only implemented in the latest browsers. And if you have the latest browser, chances are you have the newest phone. If you have the newest phone, you're probably in the latest network. So basically, there's a population bias there, right? It's like, it's this room, because all of you guys have the, the latest gadgets. Uh, that's not true universally. In fact, it's a lot slower. So uh, I would guess that if you double this number, we probably wouldn't be too far off. So that's a state of art, and the next question is, well, why does it take five seconds to load a median page? Like, that's kind of crazy, right? So a great, another great project is HTTP Archive, htparchive.org, uh, which crawls the web, and, or it crawls uh, the most popular destinations on the web, I should say, and instead of actually gathering the content, it looks at how are these pages constructed, like how many CSS files do you have, how many images, what was the size of those images. And it provides us some historical data uh, for measuring how the web is built. So we can see here is this is actually for mobile sites specifically. An average page, mobile page today is approximately 700 kilobytes, and it consists of 60 requests. So this is CSS files, JavaScript, et cetera, right? And if you look at the actual makeup of the page, approximately 500 kilobytes out of that 700 kilobytes is an image. So that in itself is a very uh, important realization. If uh, you're not optimizing your images today, uh, that is perhaps the number one thing that you can do. Uh, if, if nothing else, just go back home today and check that you're optimizing images correctly, uh, whatever that means. And uh, I say whatever that means because you know, oftentimes we optimize uh, for example, a PNG file and remove some metadata and we're like, okay, we're done. And the problem was, the problem though is that this file should have been saved as a JPEG file instead. And there's a difference of hundreds of kilobytes in there, right? So make sure you're picking the right image format to begin with. I can't tell you the number of three megabyte PNG files I found on the web, which you know, when saved as a JPEG are like 250 kilobytes. So um, images are important. And of course, the second biggest one is JavaScript. And then only after that do we have HTML. And the funny thing is, you know, you look at this, like an average page consists of six HTML pages. What? Um, iframes, right? So you're including content, you're including ads, you're including other things, you're pulling in all of this stuff. So we're actually, an average page today is cons consists of 60 different resources, which is very, very big. And another interest, interesting stat that kind of floored me the first time I read it uh, was that for a lot of users, uh, mobile is actually the primary and the only way to access the web. 
In fact, you know, if you look at the bottom here, for United States, a quarter of mobile users, for a quarter of mobile users, uh, it is their only way to access the web, right? So uh, I say that floored me because I tend to think of the mobile phone as kind of like a secondary thing, right? Like I want to go, I need to check something quickly, but I can always go back to my laptop and do the, you know, the real work, if you will. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's not true for a significant fraction of the users, right? And it makes you think in a different way when you construct your mobile application as well. Like you shouldn't be hiding content uh, with the assumption that somebody will go back to a desktop computer and then have the full experience, right? You need to provide the full experience on mobile. So all of this is good. And of course, you know, there's ads everywhere. Uh, you, you can't... Uh, you can't not see a billboard that says like 4G, fastest thing ever. Uh, it'll save the world, you should upgrade today. Um, and this is really not a problem, right? Like pages are getting bigger, so what? I'll just upgrade to 4G, everything's cool. Well, not so fast. So this is a report uh, that FCC has done for a couple of years, and this is not for mobile, I should say. This is specifically for United States, and what they wanted to measure was, what is the latency of different connection types uh, within the United States? So specifically, uh, they gathered a panel of people and they, they gave you a device in, that you would deploy in your home and they would deploy a device at the ISP. So the intent was to measure kind of that last mile latency. This is not from your computer to the destination or some server. This is just to your ISP. And they wanted to measure the latency. So the, the end results were basically if you have fiber today, that's about 18 milliseconds. If you have DSL, that's 43 milliseconds and cable somewhere in between. Now, why, why am I mentioning this? Well. If you think about it, 43 milliseconds, uh, that's just between you, your house, and whoever your, your ISP is, right? And then you have to go to the actual server and fetch all this content. 43 milliseconds in terms of like light, uh, light time is like going from San Francisco to New York, right? Except here, you're probably going tens of miles. So this latency is actually a, a real bottleneck on the web today for web browsing. But all of that kind of pales in comparison when you look at mobile, because you know the first time I saw the the numbers for for Wired, I was like, wow, this is a lot a lot higher than I thought. Th then I started digging through the mobile carrier technical FAQs, and I walked away in horror. Uh, basically, what they're saying is, and this is a, an exact snippet from uh, one of the networks, right? So for for Sprint 4G, uh, you should expect three to six megabits of download speed which is good, that's, you know, that's great, uh, but the average latency is 150 milliseconds. So that's like going to, from here to London and back, right? Uh, and that's just to your mobile carrier. And remember, uh, we want to render everything within 200 milliseconds, right? And, this, and what we're saying here is like, expect on average just to like send a packet 150 milliseconds just to the carrier. So you've got 50 milliseconds left to render everything and you know, do, do all the rest. Not a good deal. And that's on 4G. On 3G, uh, you should expect uh, three, 400 milliseconds of latency. So this is like half a second just to send a packet out, right? So we have our one second budget. We can send a packet, get it back, and we're already half, we spent already, already spent half the budget. So you know, here are some numbers comparing uh, a couple of different carriers in the United States. Basically, they're identical, right? Different carriers use slightly different uh, goalposts just to be safe, but you can assume that on a 3G network, you're gonna be somewhere in the 250 millisecond range. That's kind of your packet time. On 4G, the numbers get better, you know, 100 milliseconds or less on some of the newer networks. But nonetheless, this, this means that latency is a very big problem on, on the mobile web. The other big problem that I don't think many people are aware of today, um, at least in the web, building the mobile web uh, apps space, is battery life. Uh, this is certainly a big, uh, big problem and something that a lot of people optimize for when they're building native apps. But on, on the mobile web, we don't tend to think about it. The problem with uh, battery life on mobile is that your radio is the second most expensive device or unit, if you will, uh, on, on the phone. So the first is, of course, the screen, right? But the screen is off most of the time. Like you're, It's in your pocket, the screen is off. The radio needs to give you this... Uh, premise of being always on, right? Like you always want to be reachable, so we, and, but we can't do that. We need to turn off the radio as aggressively as we can but it is, because it is very, very expensive uh, to keep it active. So what this entails is uh, 
this kind of dichotomy of control and user plane latencies. So this is definitely getting into the weeds of how the mobile networks uh, work. If you're curious about this, I have a very good resource for you at the very end, 60 pages of it. But very quickly, I'll, I'll describe um, what uh, control and user plane, user plane latencies mean. In a nutshell, when you have your mobile phone, if you want to send something, you don't just send it. You say, hey, carrier, I would like to send some data. And the carrier listens to that and says, OK, um, use this transmit power on this channel at this time, and you have this amount of time to send your data. You negotiate this kind of back and forth a little bit. Um, then you have your resource assignment, and then you actually send data. Right? This is what's known as control plane latency. So you can't just wake up and say, hey, I got like, a request to send. First, you've got to talk to the tower. The tower needs to permit you to do that. And this negotiation takes time. So that's what we mean by this, by this control plane latency. Then once you have the actual assignment, you need to send data to the tower itself. And that also takes time. And the reason I mention this is you know, this is completely transparent to us, especially as web developers. We, we never get to interact at this level. But it imposes some very serious uh, latencies. And I'm guessing, I'm guessing I'm kind of blocking these numbers here. So in, in 4G, uh, this first part right here can take up to 100 milliseconds. So this is just from the moment that the user, for example, clicks on a button or a link. It may take 100 milliseconds just to negotiate that you want to send something. Then you actually need to send the packet. And then once you have this assignment, it'll take uh, approximately 50 milliseconds for each new packet to go from, from your device just to the radio tower. Then from the radio tower, it needs to traverse the mobile carrier network, which is that 200 milliseconds that they're, that they're assigning to that number. And then you need to go to your server. So you know, this is pretty complicated. And in 3G, uh, this gets actually even worse. Um, this first step of negotiating a connection can take up to two and a half seconds. So this, I, I, the reason I put uh, this entire slide here is probably just because of this. A lot of times I hear uh, people saying, or developers saying, that mo designing for the mobile web is very hard. Uh, the latencies are so variable, I can't predict anything. And it is true that the, the variability is very high, but it's usually explained by this, which is if your radio has been idle or has been off for a while, the first time you need to send a packet of data, there's this startup cost, if you will, that only occurs when the connection needs to be established. So why, why does this matter? Well, it matters because when I click on a button on my 3G connection, right, and then I want to like, navigate to something, it'll take up to two and a half seconds just to send the first packet. And that is significant time if you think about it from a, like a UX point of view, right? Like two and a half seconds, you should be taking that into account when you're, when you're designing your mobile application. So the UI needs to adjust. And then after all of that, uh, the device is also has a very active power management system, which is actually managed by, by the tower. So for example, uh, this is the LTE, this is the 4G case. In 4G, uh, we already described the case of going from idle to active, right? So my phone is idle, I decided to send some data. I need to go to the active mode, which will take 260 milliseconds. Then I, you know, I, I send all of my requests, um, and then my phone is once again idling. Maybe, maybe I'm reading the page. As I'm idling, after 100 milliseconds, the tower actually tells you, hey, you, uh, go into low power state uh, because you need to preserve power. So you go into the state, and uh, let's say at, at this moment you actually click on a different link. You need to re, uh, kind of redo the negotiation and go back to active state. The good news is this may take a little bit less time, so 50 milliseconds, okay. But let's say that you, you're actually idle, right? So you, you wait 100 milliseconds, you're idle, you wait another 100 milliseconds, you go into a, a deeper sleep, if you will, where you're only listening periodically. And then after about 10 seconds, you actually go back to idle mode. So if you're building a mobile uh, website, you, you fetch a page, or your user vis visits your page, and they, you fetch all the content, they're reading the page, they take more than 10 seconds, the radio is already idle. So you have to, you'll have to incur that upgrade cost again, which may be uh, 100 milliseconds to two and a half seconds. Right? This is something that you should keep in mind. And once, once you're aware of this, you can actually design around it. You can actually structure your application in a way that you know that this is going to happen. Um, very, very similar thing in 3G. I'm not going to go through this in detail, uh, but basically they have 
you know, a couple of different states. And once again, you know, for those that are curious about this, you know, I have a good resource for you. I just wanted to just, uh, show this here because uh, this, this first upgrade takes up to two seconds. Yeah. Right, so like, where is this guy going with all of this? this? This is just, this is weird. Um, so ha having said that, right, there's a couple of things that I want you to take away from everything we've covered so far. Uh, latency is highly variable on mobile networks. Uh, you can account for some of it. 4G networks will definitely help, but 4G networks are, uh, it'll take a while to deploy them, actually. Uh, we all, probably everybody in this room already is on a 4G connection. The reality is, um, is that 4G, or actually 3G, will be with us for another decade, at least another decade. When you talk to the carriers, they will all tell you that the existing 3G networks will be here, they'll be in supporting role, and in fact, you'll be migrating from 4G to 3G all the time for the next decade. Uh, it takes a lot of resources to deploy these new networks. Carriers have already invested a lot of money uh, into existing 3G networks, so uh, you know, this is, 4G is not, it, it won't solve all things. And uh, all of the usual optimizations that you apply on a desktop web, things like reusing connections, downloading resources in bulk, I think this is actually something that is underappreciated. Um, mobile networks are optimized for bulk transfers, not for small transfers where, you, uh, where you're very cautious and you say, well, let, let me fetch this one thing and then determine that if I should fetch another thing. It's like, no, they, they want you to fetch as much as you can and then turn off the radio because they want to preserve battery power. And they're optimized for that. So let's leave the kind of the network stack aside and actually look at the browser now. Um, what does it take to render a page? And I, th I think a lot of the stuff should be uh, very familiar to you guys, but I think it's still worth uh, to review this. We talked about the network. You know, we, we fetch some bytes. Uh, the browser has this uh, resource loader, which basically says, "Okay, I need this HTML page. I need the CSS files," and then it starts uh, parsing the the HTML file itself. And roughly what happens here is, you know, we get some bytes off the wire, which are actually, you know, some, some set of characters. We start converting these characters as soon as we get them. So we don't wait to get the entire HTML page. If you send us the first five packets, uh, you know, first 10 bytes of your HTML, we will immediately start parsing it and trying to figure out, okay, he's asking for a CSS file right here, and here's an image tag. So let's, you know, start fetching that as quickly as we can. So uh, that's helpful because, you know, if, depending on how your application server is structured, you should be flushing the important content all the time. And a good example of this uh, that, that I love to share is Google Search. So one trick that we do with Google Search is uh, you send us a search query, right? Let's, let's say you have a blank page. You send us a search query. We get the first packet of that query. We don't even look at what the query is. We're like, great, we got a query. Here's the header for the, H for, for the search page. Right? And then once you get the bytes for the header and the, the page is already being rendered in a browser, and then we start looking at the, your actual query and we're like, okay, so you're asking about HTML5, let us dispatch the queries and kind of fill in the content uh, as, uh, as it comes. So that in itself actually speeds up the loading experience in your browser by quite a bit. So that's a technique that you can also leverage in your own application. It, require, it definitely requires some careful architecture of your application server, but it can do wonders if you do it well. So, in any case, we, we construct uh, kind of this tree. We start constructing the DOM tree, right? Which is something that we interact with uh, all the time via JavaScript and all the rest. And uh, one thing that's often forgotten is to get something visible on the screen, you don't just need the DOM tree or the HTML, you also need the CSS. And in fact, those two are coupled. We can't paint something to the screen until we have all of the style information. Because otherwise, if we were to paint it without the styles, you would get this like ugly layout. Right? And then we would fl uh, you know, flash it with the updated layout. Uh, that's not a good experience. So basically we're stuck. Like we, need, we need the HTML and we need the CSS and we need them as quickly as possible. And in theory, these two things can be constructed in parallel. Right? And then we get, we get this render tree and we kind of print it to the screen or paint it to the screen, I should say. So far, so good. This is, this is the great case. Uh, the problem is we have this thing called JavaScript. It's nothing but paint. So here's an example, right? I have a very simple HTML5 page. Uh, it's a valid HTML5 page, I should say, as well, which is, I think is awesome. Um, and approximately at the on, on the bottom here, I have how the parser actually sees it, right? So we see the HTML tag, or actually we don't even see the HTML tag, but we kind of inject it in there. We don't see the head tag, but the parser 
injects that in there. This is all uh, for the first time ever in HTML5. We've actually like we have a hard specification for how these bytes should be interpreted into this tree, which is great. So we see this text, awesome HTML5 page, and then we get to the script tag, and we're like, wait a second, uh, we need to stop the world. Uh, we can't proceed. We can't, in fact, look at this link tag here uh, because the script tag could overwrite what comes next, right? And what happens here is this. When you have a script, uh, one of the great features or bugs, depending on how you look at it, in, in our implementation of, of, of JavaScript and, and, and the DOM is that JavaScript can write directly into the, into the HTML itself. So you could do something as crazy as like have a script that writes another script in line, right? And we don't know, we have no idea what's, what's coming next. So we say, okay, we have to stop the world, fetch this JavaScript, execute it, do whatever it tells us, and then, and only then can we proceed moving forward, right? And in the meantime, you should be thinking, wait, so to render something, I need the CSS as well, but the CSS is coming after this. So guess what? We're not painting anything to the screen while you're waiting for this, right? So we just created this really nasty dependency chain, uh, which is not good. So one of the ways you work around this, and I'm sure you guys have seen uh, this pattern everywhere, is asynchronous scripts, right? No performance talk is complete without a mention of use asynchronous script or use asynchronous scripts. This is a pattern that's been popularized by Google Analytics. It's available everywhere. But basically, if you have tags like this in your code, go fix it, right? Go use something like this because this will actually block rendering. Uh, maybe this is not applicable for every single script, but it is certainly the pattern that you should be using wherever and whenever possible. So basically what it actually ends up looking like is you have the DOM tree, you have the style rules, and you have JavaScript in between. And the nasty kind of relationship there is that JavaScript can modify the DOM, but it can also query the CSS, right? Because from JavaScript, you can say, what, by the way, what is the style of this element, right? So there's this dependency in there, and what it means is uh, rendering is blocked on CSS. We already said that. Uh, but uh, JavaScript can uh, query uh, CSS as well, so we have this dependency chain. Right, so JavaScript can block the DOM construction, JavaScript can block on CSS, rendering is blocked on CSS. Um, therefore, you know, if you want to make fast sites, not just mobile sites, any sites, you need to get the CSS down to the client as quickly as possible. I mean, it means removing everything out of the path, out of the rendering path, and making sure that you get that CSS down as, as quickly as you can, including inlining. Uh, inlining CSS styles right in the header uh, of, your, uh, of your page. So something we use on Google Search and in many other products, right? Um, and I'm not saying that you should be inlining all of your CSS. Uh, there's an important distinction there. Uh, you should be inlining the critical, let's say, above the fold CSS, such that you can get something visible on the screen, and then you can fill in the content later. And we'll come back to this in a second. And, you know, scripts. Uh, scripts cause a lot of problems in terms of rendering. All right, so we talked about the browser, we talked about the network in gory details, and let's try and actually uh, pull it all together. So this scary beast right here is, comes from the uh, W3C navigation timing uh, specification. And if you guys are not familiar with it, uh, what this, each one of these labels here is actually a timer that is tracked by your browser that you can access whenever the page is, has loaded. And roughly speaking, you know, there's a lot of tags in here or a lot of labels. It captures three things. User connectivity, things like how long did the TCP connection take? How long did the DNS lookup take? What was their server response time? To uh, browser execution uh, timestamps as well. So you could say, well, how long did it take for me to execute uh, all of my scripts in the onload handler? You have all of this instrumentation uh, in your browser today. And the way you access it, it's maybe a little bit small, if you, if you just uh, pop up your JavaScript console, and you type in performance.timing, it will give you a JavaScript object back with all of these timestamps in uh, microsecond granularity. Like, you know we're serious about performance when we're measuring stuff in microseconds, right? So uh, this is available in all these browsers. Uh, there's a lot of good analytics packages that will track this for you. So if, you, if you're not using a real user measurement, which is what this is all about, right? This is gathering data from real browsers uh, visiting your site. Uh, which is very important. There's a difference between synthetic testing and real user measurement testing. In synthetic testing, you're saying, look, I have 
let's say, 10 servers around the world, one in Tokyo, one in San Francisco, one in uh, New York, and I'm going to get those servers to ping me and tell me what my response time is, which is useful. That's, that's a good baseline. But what you want to gather is real performance data from your users. For all you know, a lot of your users are using really old 3G phones, and that's good to know, right? So you will capture that performance data, and you can analyze it against your actual goals, your benchmarks. So um, that data will give you all of these timings of, that I'm going to talk about here. But you know, in short, let, let's try and connect the pieces. For one HTML request, right? this is you typing in Bloomberg.com, you hit enter. Uh, there's a bunch of things that need to happen uh, to fetch that page. First, we need to figure out what, where does this Bloomberg.com thing live. We need to look up the IP, IP address. Right? So that's going to take some time. Um, then we need to do uh, a TCP connection, uh, do the handshake, which is another round trip time. Um, then we need to send the actual HTTP request. And by the way, by this point in time, we already you know, could be 500 milliseconds have passed. Then we send the HTTP request. Then you process your actual page, give us the HTML, and then we deliver it to the client. And the size of that page will determine how long you know, this bar is. So some of these don't need to happen all the time, of course. right? If we already know what the DNS uh, resolution is, we don't need to do it. If we can reuse the same connection, we, we will also reuse it. Uh, the browser will do all of this for you. But on the first request, chances are the user will have to go through each one of these steps. So let's do some math. Um, in, oh, that's kind of hard to see. So this line, the control plane, is what I described earlier, right? Your phone is idle, and all of a sudden you're, you're hitting enter to, to load this page. On, let's say on 3G, uh, this could take anywhere from 200 to 2.5 seconds, 200 milliseconds to 2.5 seconds, I should say, right? Next, we need to perform the DNS lookup, TCP connection time, and the reason I'm saying it's, it's a minimum of 200 milliseconds, because this is what the carriers are telling us. This is how long it's going to take us within our own network to, uh, to render this page. So you, you kind of go through all of this, uh, and at the bottom, you say, OK, so I started with a one second budget, right? Like, we want to get a page visible on the screen within one second. What does that leave us? Well, in the worst case, we already burnt all of our budget, because you know, like this thing alone would have killed it. But in the better case, you know, maybe the phone has already been active, uh, we have about 400 milliseconds left. Uh, to get something visible on the screen. With 4G, things get a little bit more interesting uh, and, or much better, I should say, not just more interesting, because we can actually reliably, more or less, get a budget of about 500 uh, milliseconds, right, for, for all, all the other work. And remember, this is for one HTTP request. Remember what we were saying at the beginning? Uh, an average page is 60 requests. So just repeat the 60 times, right, and you get to five seconds. Um, no, uh, our goal is to actually get the page visible on the screen. So what will it take, right? Like, our pages are not single requests, but maybe they should be. Or maybe there's a, an in-between, right? Maybe there's certain things, maybe there's certain techniques that we can use to inline the correct stuff, if you will, and uh, get the page visible and then fill in the necessary content afterwards. So let's do some uh, reverse math here. Let's say we have a 400 millisecond budget. So I'm kind of splitting the difference between 3G and 4G, and I'm saying you know, a lot of your users will be using both. We won't be switching to 4G overnight. So 400 milliseconds, right? We still haven't talked about server response time, so you need to take that account into account. And I'm going to claim that this should be under 100 milliseconds. If you really want to uh, meet this goal, it should be under 100 milliseconds, which is uh, aggressive, admi uh, admittedly. Next is, we haven't actually accounted for the client rendering time. Like, we've shipped all the bytes, but the browser still needs to do all the work to lay out the page, you know, paint the pixels, transfer them from the GPU to your screen, all this work. So reserve about 100 milliseconds for that, too. Right? That's just kind of the cost of rendering a page. So really, what we're left is about 200 milliseconds. This is 200 milliseconds to perform all of the JavaScript, if you have any, uh, for that first page. And maybe, maybe, if you're on 4G, you can dispatch like a request uh, in there, right, to fetch some additional content to render the first page. So not much budget, right? Basically, we're saying one HTML request and then maybe one more for, for some other asset. So this is just a, a quick summary, right? The, the hard facts. Uh, most, of the, most of our one-second budget is just network latency overhead. So just take half of it off the table because that's, that's what it is. 
uh, you need to make your servers fast. So 100 milliseconds or less, you need to allocate some time for the browser. Never forget this, right? Uh, another uh, good practice to have is to always set a budget, always set a performance budget, whether that's a one second budget or if you're building, for example, you're trying to build smooth animations in your application, trying to deliver 60 frames per second, right? You do the math and you say, okay, uh, to do 60 frames per second, I have 16 milliseconds to render each and every frame. So as long as I fit all my work within 16 milliseconds, I'm good, right? Not really, because uh, the browser also needs to do its work, right? You're not the only one doing things in the browser. So really, you have at most 10 milliseconds if you want to meet that budget. So never forget the overhead of the browser itself. And the implications of all of this is that really, we can't afford to make re additional requests or not many requests. We have to inline the most important stuff, if you will, and that most important stuff is CSS for the reasons that I described earlier, right? We need the CSS to paint something to the screen, so you need to identify what is the critical CSS for this specific page. And the critical CSS is like the stuff that's above the fold. It's the first thing that the user sees. You can fill in the rest later. And to the extent possible, eliminate and move JavaScript uh, downstream, right? It is true that you know, we're increasingly using JavaScript frameworks to build the actual page itself, like it's the JavaScript that's laying out the divs and spans and all the rest. Um, that's gonna be hard to achieve with something like this. But a significant fraction, the majority actually of the mobile web today is using JavaScript to enhance things. Things like add on-click handlers and uh, add social widgets and all of this kind of stuff. All of which could be safely deferred until you, uh, until you paint something to the screen and then you do that. So, you know, a very simple in the toy example, admittedly, but uh, just to illustrate the point, right? Here's a very simple page. We have our style sheet at the top. So first of all, the order is correct here, right? So in the previous example I showed you, I had my script above the style sheet, which is definitely not, not what you want to do. So we're fetching the CSS and we're fetching application.js. So far, so good, right? This is pretty much as clean as it gets. The implication of everything we've talked about is that really, if you want to render in another one second, you need to inline the CSS. You need to take that file and you need to figure out what are the most important bits. That's what we're doing at the top. And then here, uh, either eliminate this JavaScript or figure out how you can defer it. And then at the bottom here, you can see what I'm doing is I'm saying, after this onload happened, after I've painted something, then go out and fetch things. Go load your analytics scripts, go load your social widgets, go load whatever you need. Yeah, and question. Um, there's been recommendations to put some of the stuff to grab it the first time and then put it off to local storage. What is the current delay to grab something from the mobile local storage and do it if you don't have all that in the header? Uh, so the question is, there's been some recommendations about uh, using local storage. So you can grab files, you know, stick them into local storage, and then w what is the cost of doing that? So the answer there is it actually varies quite a bit by the browser and the platform. So for example, on, on Windows, uh, Windows has its own um, system level kind of prefetching architecture, which will prefetch uh, necessary bytes, which makes access to local storage actually very fast, uh, which is not true, for example, on Linux and OS X. And different browsers use different uh, prefetching techniques for this thing. So uh, the short answer is the, uh, the performance can actually vary quite a bit. Uh, it can be up to 100 milliseconds just to open the local storage uh, file. Uh, but that, that is certainly a technique that you could use, right? Uh, the other thing, I guess, is I'm not saying that you shouldn't be using the browser cache here, right? What I'm saying is you need to figure out what is a critical CSS. And remember that uh, you, you may still have enough time to do like one, one uh, request. And I'm, what I'm saying here is that request should probably be the CSS. And that should live in your cache, and you probably shouldn't worry about putting in your local storage. Although that is certainly a technique that you can explore. Um, right, okay, so run, you know, defer style sheets, defer JavaScript, defer all, everything you can, get something visible, and then progressively fill in this content. And, you know, this is all good in theory. How do you actually go about doing this? And um, admittedly, there's not a lot of great tools out there to help you uh, on, with, with this task, but there are a few, and I think they're actually, they, they go a long way. So the first one, and the one that I'm most familiar with, is if you look in your uh, Chrome DevTools, if you go into the Audits panel, uh, one of the audits is the web page performance. This is a very kind of little known tip. If you run the 
a web performance uh, test, it'll actually tell you that, hey, on this specific page, here are all the CSS files that you've loaded, but I looked at all the styles that you're using, and 61% of those styles are not being applied here, right? So you just kind of, you put everything into your CSS, and like, it doesn't matter, right? Like, it's all .css. And this is, in fact, uh, a good case. Uh, I know that on my own side, for some pages, it's 90% or 95% not being used because it's a very simple page, but I've kind of put everything into one thing. So not only that, but we can actually open up any one of these files, and it'll tell you the exact selectors that are not being used. Right? So if, if nothing else, you can open this page, kind of look at your landing page on your home page, and figure out the specific chunks and just kind of pull, pull them out. Uh, you can also do this programmatically. You can actually write a script that will walk the structure of your page, query which styles are being applied, and then kind of extract it that way. And uh, one of the projects that we have at Google called PageSpeed, uh, we have an open source implementation called Mod PageSpeed for Apache. We're actually experimenting with this right now. We're actually trying to build a filter uh, that will automatically, if you will, uh, it'll load the page, we will traverse the DOM, we will figure out what are the critical assets or the critical uh, CSS styles, we will beacon that data back to the server, kind of accumulate this data for a little while, and then start inlining the critical CSS. You know, this, this is kind of crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, but we have indications, early indications, that this is actually going to work. So hopefully we can automate a lot of this stuff. But if not, uh, you know, there's some tools there. Uh, the other uh, cool little tool that I don't think many people are aware of is uh, we have this thing called the Critical Path Explorer. And uh, I'll show you at the very end kind of a quick example of this. But the difference here is you know, don't, don't worry about the, you know, reading the specific names of each one of these assets. Basically, I'm looking at Guardian Co. UK. And here's the water, full waterfall graph for that page, right? Like tens and tens of resources being fetched. Uh, kind of see the stepladder. And the idea behind critical path is, OK, great. That's what it takes to render the full page. But what are the critical assets that we need to render something on the screen, period? Right? Some of the stuff that we load is not applied above the screen, et cetera. And that's what this tool will extract. You click a button, and it transforms that page or that view into this view. Right? So you very quickly can see, OK, um, I'm depending, like here's my HTML page, which depends on this JavaScript file, and it fetches this CSS. So here's a quick example. Um, hopefully you guys can see that. So we have, we fetched the HTML and actually that uh, purple bar there actually indicates that there's 300 millisecond redirect. Uh, redirect. And um, you know, if you're trying to build a page that is rendering within one second, redirects are obviously an anti-pattern, right? So I'll just leave that out there. Um, after that, uh, we can actually start iterating. And actually, I'll point out another thing. Um, I'll be frank and I'll say that this tool is still under active development. The actual UI for this, I think, is terrible. Uh, but we'll make it better, I promise. What this little thing tells you is this is where the DOM content loaded, DOM content loaded uh, event fires. So what this tells you is that we're not deferring, or this page, Guardian, is not deferring any assets whatsoever. Right? So it's going to take way more than one second. But here's an example, right? You can actually hover all over all of these, and it'll tell you that, OK, so we're loading jQuery.min. Um, after that, we have some uh, show ads.js, which then writes the Google Ads script inside. So kind of this nested dull pattern. Uh, this is terrible for performance, right? Because we're, we're kind of we're, we're nesting scripts inside other scripts. Uh, and then after all of that, we have some long-running JavaScript. I, I don't even know what it is. I didn't dig into it. But it takes uh, on the order of 60 or 70 milliseconds. So this view in itself uh, is very, very powerful because it allows you to see, like, sure, there's dozens and dozens of resources, but what are the critical ones on my page? And your goal is to eliminate as many of those as you can or move them out beyond that e event of, of the first paint. So you know, I could have, I guess, started with the slide, and we could have been done 45 minutes ago. One request, inline the critical styles. Hopefully, I've motivated uh, why and, and why that's important, and defer the rest. Right? And this, is, uh, this actually sounds, the first time I've, I've kind of went through this exercise, I, I was very skeptical because it seems very hard to do. In practice, it turns out that mo for most pages, the kind of the critical path is not that complicated. Right? You're fetching dozens of resources, but there's only so many files that are actually important. And what you need to do is figure out how to defer the rest and kind of maybe shuffle the structure of your page a little bit. 
So it's not all that bad. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll take some questions if we have time. Um, I'll mention two things. The slides should be there, uh, bit.ly mobile barrier. And I am currently working on this book with O'Reilly called High Performance Browser Networking. So if you, if you really want to dive into how the mobile radio works and all the rest, uh, it's actually available online for free. It's still in early development, so you know, there's typos and all the rest. If anything, I would appreciate your feedback. Uh, but it's online and it's free, so check it out. And I'd love your feedback on it. All right, so with that, uh, big round of applause for Thank you.